Hi, everybody. I have a very special guest here today, a man who I have come to call my friend, and I'm honored to be able to say that. Max Alvarez is the editor-in-chief of the Real News Network in Baltimore and host of Working People, a podcast about the lives, jobs, dreams, and struggles of the working class today. He is the author of The Work of Living, Working People Talk About Their Lives and The Year the World Broke which is a collection of interviews with workers conducted during the height of the COVID pandemic that will be published by Orr Books. His work has been featured in a range of outlets, including The Nation, In These Times, Boston Review, and The Baffler. You can also find Max on Twitter at at Maximilian underscore Alv. Hi, Max. How are you? Hey, Marianne. Great to be with you again. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, you are someone I learn from, not only in your professional capacity, but also personally. I feel that I can sometimes say, okay, can you give me the scoop, as it were? What's the deeper story? What's going on? So I want to talk to you about two things. I want to talk to you about how you see this resurgence of the modern labor movement right now. Um, Sarah Nelson, Christian Smalls, yourself, so many people who are out there. And also, specifically, I'd like to talk about East Palestine, if we might. So I want to throw it over to you. Uh, give us your general sense of, of any of the above and all of the above so we can start talking. Yeah, well, um, so we got a lot to, to dig into, as always. And again, I'm very grateful to be here with you to do it. Uh, and I appreciate you lifting up these uh, stories because they're very, very important. And as we have seen time and time again, um, you know, the mainstream media, um, you know, keeps getting chances to course correct <laughs> its coverage on these things and very seldom takes those chances. I, I will say that the coverage of the uh, catastrophic train derailment of a Norfolk Southern freight train in East Palestine, Ohio, has gotten better. Um, than what we saw during the high stakes contract negotiations that were playing out between the uh, rail companies and the unions representing rail workers last year. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. So I'll, I'll circle back to East Palestine in a second because I think you're right. It it crystallizes so much of what is so rotted and wrong and that has been uh, the deliberate choices that have been made um, th that have like put all of us at hazard and that have immiserated and hollowed out and desiccated our shared society for the sake of profits and control for a small handful of people and companies. I think all of that really comes to a head in East Palestine, and I'll explain to folks what I mean in a second. But just to sort of take that bird's eye view that you mentioned earlier. I do think that we are in a critical moment right now, very much extended from the last time that we spoke. I think we spoke uh, in the wake of the historic union election victory at the JFK 8 warehouse, uh, Amazon warehouse on Staten Island. Right? We were talking about the Amazon workers. <clears throat> And, you know, I, I since then I have continued to interview workers from all different types of industries all across the country and, in fact, uh, beyond. And I think that you're right, that there is what many workers have described to me. I'll use the term that a railroader, Mary Lee Taylor, said. She says, you can feel the groundswell if you're listening closely enough. Mm -hmm. You can sense the mounting not just frustration – not just the anger, um, not just the despair, but this rising sense that no one is coming to save us. It's mm -hmm. only us <clears throat> who are going to be able to to help ourselves climb out of this and, and, and save the, what's left of our crumbling society. And I think that that is the sort of spirit that I've heard animating so many different corners of the labor movement. I was just um, in New York City actually doing a, a live taping of my show Working People at the People's Forum. Chris Smalls uh, was there. He gave the introduction to the event. I was also there with incredible organizers, young organizers. Like we're talking folks in their 20s and early 30s from Home Depot in Philly, right, where Vince Quiles, you know, a young uh, guy who's worked there for five years, led the union drive there. It was ultimately unsuccessful, but it's really galvanized a lot mm -hmm. of folks in a notoriously anti-union company to start talking about organizing. We talked to 
uh, uh, members of the Local 79, Labor's Local 79 Construction Workers Union in the New York City, um, folks organizing with Trader Joe's um, and Starbucks. I, I have interviewed uh, workers at Medieval Times who are on strike, you know, journalists uh, in Pittsburgh at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette on strike, right? So you're seeing, I think, uh, a lot of different sectors uniting around very shared or similar concerns, right? Just constant abuse or or, or mistreatment from management. Um, you know, like just the the disrespect for people's basic sense of humanity. That can look a lot of different ways. It can look like just you know being mistreated and being talked down to by management. It can look like managers changing your schedule every week. Some weeks you have 40 hours, some weeks you have 15. There's really no respect for who you are as a person outside of work. What if you have kids that you got to take care of? What if you need over 20 hours a week in order to maintain eligibility for your health care, right? I mean, like just all those different ways that the lack of respect manifests, people are really, I think, I think the frustration with that is boiling over. But more than that, people are connecting it to the larger systemic issues that are causing so many workers in different industries to have so many of the same complaints. And then when you zoom out even more, I think what is really exciting about this moment is that you are seeing this very much, this groundswell rise internationally. We just published a, an episode on my podcast that I'm very proud of where I had um, workers, railroad workers from the United States from the United Kingdom and from France, all of whom, you know, are engaged in, in really crucial struggles right now. We got them on the same call to talk about what's going on. And I'm hearing so many echoes of what we're dealing with here in the States over there in Europe, right? I mean, um, you know, the, you're, the UK is seeing more strikes right now than it's seen in a generation. We're talking rail workers as well. We're talking healthcare workers at the NHS, higher education workers, civil servants, like everywhere it's popping off in the UK. And in France, um, workers are prepared to, to wage an indefinite general strike to save the country's beloved pension system from the neoliberal onslaught that uh, President Emmanuel Macron is trying to force through right now. But you also have strikes in Greece. You have strikes in Belgium. Cost of living crisis is really leading all those frustrations to boil over. And again, it's becoming clearer as day. Uh, every day that passes that, you know, the governing establishment, the powers that be, the IMF, the Fed, you know, like Wall Street, like no one's looking out for us. We're all just expected to bear the brunt of this and assume that like nothing can be done about this situation except asking working people to sacrifice. And frankly, we are done sacrifice. Yeah. We have sacrificed yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. They they say it's a complicated situation. And of course, it's not complicated. It's just corrupt. Mm -hmm. And uh, these these are global dynamics. A lot of these companies are multinational companies. So uh, they're doing what they do in whatever country uh, will allow them to do it. I think the situation in East Palestine is such an embodiment. It's like a microcosm of the whole thing. It's like something out of a movie. Um, take all of the elements of the injustices towards workers, uh, towards communities, towards um, anyone involved uh, other than stockholders, and it's all just coagulates in this one horrible incident. Uh, talk to us about what happened. When you and I talked about East Palestine before, you were, you were telling me about the warnings that workers have made. You were talking about the antiquated brake system, about the, the deregulation that Trump brought, that Biden did, Biden did not reverse this, that uh, Obama had tried to limit uh, some of the chemical um, uh, uh, chemical um, collections that would be on these trains, but they were pushed back uh, by the by the um, uh, by the company. And you also told me about the um, the fact that in order for the warning system to work correctly, there needs to be a worker monitoring every 200 miles, but they had taken it down to one worker every 1,000 miles. So uh, you have those deeper facts and deeper elements of the story. So uh, tell us your take on East Palestine. And then, of course, after that, I want to talk about how you see what's happening there now. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, I mean, I'll start where I imagine most people are, right? Because as much as I would love to tell myself this, most people aren't 
reading, listening to, or watching the reporting that we do at the, at the Real News. I'm, I'm very proud of the work that we do. I think it's made a dent. We have been really committed to lifting up the voices of workers, um, the people who know this industry best. Uh, for over a year now, we've been relentlessly reporting on the crisis on the freight rail system publishing hours and hours and hours of interviews with workers who, as you said, were all warning that something like this was going to happen, right? And so I want to explain to folks why they were warning about that. But before we get there, right, if you haven't been hearing these voices, if you only really have gotten, you know, like a a, a sort of shock uh, to your system when, say, we were approaching a national rail shutdown in September or once again in late November, early December, that's when Biden and Congress forced workers to accept uh, a contract that the majority of workers actually voted down in order to, quote unquote, avert a national rail shutdown, right? Those were the two times that like this crisis actually made headlines uh, in the way that it should. Um, And then it kind of went away. Then, you know, the derailment in East Palestine happens and everyone's kind of freaking out, wondering where the heck this all came from. Well, I would argue that the two are very much connected. But if you're watching mainstream media, there's a lot of basically bad journalism out there that really misses like the forest from the trees because this is a catastrophic derailment of a Norfolk Southern train, a freight train, right? There are seven major class one uh, freight rail companies, soon to be six, because those have been merging and the mergers and acquisitions have been going for 40 years. And now if there's basically like a shared oligopoly on the freight rail system. They're not competing with each other. No one's out here building more railroads, right? Or rail lines, and so you have this this essentially a cartel of companies that have a total lock on their industry and are able to do whatever they want. And the government has been letting them do it for, you know, decades at this point. Right. So we're going to get to that in a second. But OK, so you have this long Norfolk Southern train, one of the major class one freight rails um, that derailed on February 3rd. Right. And uh, it was I believe there was 150 cars on this train. You know, it's like nearly two miles long. Um, It was carrying a lot of cars full of hazardous materials, primarily, but not exclusively vinyl chloride. Um, So when the train derailed just outside of East Palestine earlier in February, uh, the the immediate emergency response kicked into gear. Um, You know, once it was recognized uh, what Uh, was on that train um, and, you know, like the damage that it can do. Uh, The town was immediately evacuated. The emergency response was actually to puncture the cars that were carrying the material vinyl chloride because it's a very flammable, uh, explosive substance. Uh, It was released into a trench and then set on fire, releasing this massive toxic plume of smoke that has, like, created a black death cloud over the area in Pennsylvania and Ohio for the past month. Um, We've been getting reports of people feeling sick, uh, fish and animals all over the area dying. The EPA has detected traces of hazardous chemicals in the water system, in the soil system. A lot of that is being removed as we speak or like that's that's kind of what we're being told is that the the emergency removal of uh, contaminated soil um, and water is underway. I think we're going to find out a lot more about the environmental impacts of this in weeks, months and in sadly years to come. And so in the immediate story, right? The question was, oh, my God, what happened? You know, like, why was this the emergency response? Um, you know, and then the finger pointing started. Who's who's responsible for this? Right. So at first it was like, oh, this is this is Trump um, for, you know, rolling back, you know, the very meager, you know, safety regulations um, that had been implemented. This was uh, Obama's fault for essentially caving to pressure from the chemical lobby, the oil and gas lobby, the railroad lobby for not pushing harder for the railroads to implement common sense safety measures like, for instance, um, you know, the classification system for highly flammable, uh, you know, uh, uh, hazardous trains, i.e. if you have a train like this, because uh, what people will say is like, well, that regulation wouldn't have helped because this train wouldn't have been classified 
under that. And I was like, yeah, well, that's the problem. This train carrying the substance right. clearly should have been classified as a highly right. flammable train. Exactly. Right. Um, and then there was the, the question about the braking systems. Um, so, like, people have probably heard a lot about this. Uh, a lot of these freight trains are using basically Civil War era braking systems that are air braking systems. You see the problem with that in a train like the Norfolk Southern train that derailed in East Palestine because those braking systems start from the front end of the train and they go train by train by train uh, moving all the way to the back. And so when you have a train this long with 150 cars, uh, it's going to take a while for all of the the – uh, the brakes on all of the cars to apply. And so you're going to have the first half of the train with the brakes applied, but then you're going to have all that momentum from the back cars kind of run up against those. So of and of course it's going to be a derailment. Yeah. So you're going to jackknife, which is exactly what happened to the train in Norfolk Southern. And so obviously um, trains like these, and in fact, I would argue all freight trains, you know, should have the electronic braking systems that enable the cars to all brake simultaneously instead of like one by one by one. But the argument that workers have been telling me, and this is like kind of hooking it back to the issues from the past year when the contract negotiations were going on, the larger picture that we're missing here. And what railroaders have told me repeatedly over the past month is that a train this long should not be on the tracks in the first place, right? Um, like that, that this is not an inevitability. The trains were not always this long, um, but this is part of the cost cutting, profit maximizing. <sighs> scheme that has been implemented by uh, across the freight rail system under the banner of what's called precision scheduled railroading. What that essentially means is everything that we were talking about last year, cutting your operation operating ratio year after year after year, which means cutting <laughs> staff, um, you know, like and, and cutting costs everywhere that you possibly can. And, you know, like just investing all like like taking all the profits jacking up the uh, uh pay for executives stock buybacks shareholder dividends the railroads are one of if not the most like profitable industries in the country they are not hurting they're making billions and billions of dollars and the way that they're doing that is by making the trains longer by making them heavier, by reducing the crew sizes on those trains, by slashing the supporting staff all around the railroads, the people in the dispatch offices, the tra the maintenance of way guys who are who are tasked with checking the track and making sure that like you know trains aren't running over track that you know like is is um, going to lead to a derailment. We've cut that workforce to the bone and we've like basically like put band-aids on by bringing on under qualified contractors uh, in a lot of these areas. The guys in the machine shop who are tasked with checking cars from top to bottom, looking at the wheel bearings, looking at everything, they have been slashed too to the point where now you have fewer people who are being tasked with inspecting more cars in less time. So the cars like – like a lot of people are saying that um, – I think uh, we now know that um, – the immediate problem that caused the derailment in uh, East Palestine was due to a bearing, right? A bearing um, caught fire. That's what we saw on the uh, a video of the train when it was passing, you know, about 20 miles uh, before it derailed. Um, now, like, that was detected by what's called a um, – like a hot box detector. So these are like uh, uh, electronic detective, um, you know, technologies that are put on all these railroads. They're meant to essentially replace the function that human beings used to serve when you had more people l checking these cars before they were actually sent out on the railroads and saying like, that looks dangerous. It needs to go to the shop, um, you know, yada, yada, yada. So you guys see where I'm going here, right? Like this is the prog this is the, uh, longer sort of um, progression of uh, uh, events that have led to not just the derailment in, in uh, East Palestine, but as people are now realizing, derailments happen all the time around the country. And that was not always the case. This has gotten worse as Wall Street greed and corporate greed have taken hold of this vital portion of our supply chain, run the workers who run it into the ground, Cut the rest, uh, cut the workforce down to the bone, um, exhaust the hell out of the people who are left, treat them like crap, 
not invest in um, the necessary preventative safety measures like, you know, having the, the, the workers who are checking these cars more extensively, like the maintenance of way guys who are checking every mile of track across this country instead of just, you know, saying like, well, we'll get to it when we get to it and we'll hope in the meantime nothing bad happens. Like this is why workers kept telling me, I don't know when it's going to happen, but, but it's gonna something happen. is going to happen. Yeah. So I read that the uh, stock dividends that uh, Norfolk Southern will be handing out are somewhere in the line of $7.5 billion, and the money that they will be giving to the citizens of East Palestine is somewhere around $6.5 million. Is that your understanding as well? That's what I heard, too. I guess I, I, I would have to double check uh, the latest, but like that is what I recall reading myself. I mean, it's just... This is bonkers, Mary. <laughs> like, yeah, it like, is bonkers. <laughs> so I think it was I think it was in a D David Sirota article that he was saying that Norfolk um, uh, Southern should have to set up a two hundred billion dollar fund to take care of uh, medical expenses that might uh, accrue to this over the next however many years. And of course, another thing is we know that Medicare for All was given universally to the citizens of Libby, Montana, after a terrible, uh, terrible tragedy there. I didn't understand why it didn't happen in Flint, uh, Michigan. Shouldn't it happen here? Shouldn't all of the residents just have Medicare for All really for the rest of their lives, or certainly as long as there's any sense that this is a medical issue that will have to be dealt with? Yes. Um, I mean, like I would say an enthusiastic yes, um, but also like it's it's yet another reminder of why everyone should have that, right? Because well, I, I couldn't agree with that more. Well, so and like you, well, just to make one quick parenthesis, because I think um, I want to address what I imagine is uh, something people have heard, right? Because I think the, you know, the Democrats really screwed up the response to this. I'm not going to say they didn't do anything, um, but they really messed up the optics for sure because they waited like 10 days before Pete Buttigieg even said anything about it, right? Biden was planning to go to Ukraine, uh, and so the optics looked terrible there. So all the while that people were looking for answers, looking for leadership, looking for accountability, they got silence. Even though the Surface Transportation Board, the EPA, they were out there doing what they need to be doing, but the people in power were not doing their side of things and actually speaking to the very real uh, frustrations and fear that people on the ground and around the country were having. And so that allowed right-wing media and right-wing grifting politicians to sort of jump in and start turning this situation into something that it wasn't really just grossly misconstruing the entire situation for their own personal and, and political gain. And the reason I mention that is because they'll people like I think it was J.D. Vance, um, you know, total nightmare of a human being who was saying like, oh, well, like it's not an accident that this is like a white Republican voting community. That's why they don't care. And as we have pointed out the real news, it's like, man, environmental it's like it's, it's so twisted and like the thing is <laughs> there was a whole report last year about how like half of the city of chicago is basically ingesting lead through the pipes predominantly the black half and yet no one cares about that you mentioned flint i mean like there are towns i mean jackson mississippi like the kind of environmental destruction that we are seeing in east palestine is happening sadly all over this country and it's and it's really regrettably a bipartisan multiracial thing to not give a shit about it pardon my language and so like we have a we have a real big crisis for poor and working people in in and around this country that is not being addressed by the people in power and we're seeing that really crystallize in east palestine ohio but i agree with you yeah Everyone should have health care. You know, like the government Obviously. should actually be regulating so, these companies. Sorry, go for it. Well, the neoliberal system is not going to fix this. They're not going to be the solution to the problem because they are the problem. I mean, the fact that there was so much corporate deregulation, whether it has to do with oil and gas, whether it has to do with the defense establishment, whether it has to do with the railroad industry, whether it has to do with insurance companies, whether it has to do with pharmaceuticals, it's all one big matrix of um, what... It, really, if you want to look at it from a psychological perspective, is a sociopathic system. And what I mean by a sociopathic system is it doesn't care. I mean, Norfolk Southern, the executives were already talking to their stockholders on a call saying, we don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about it. We have a billion dollars in insurance to cover with no acknowledgement that there's something much bigger going on here than stock dividends. 
uh, there, there's people's lives. There's the earth itself. So what is your hope? I, I know you said that the Democrats messed up the optics. That's obvious. But what are the kind of regulatory measures that in a perfect world would be made? One, I suppose, would have to do with the brake system. One would have to do with the warning system. And obviously, as, as, as you point out, because this does not apply just to this situation, a bolstering of unions, because as you've said here several times on this program, if the union workers had been listened to, are there, now you said the workers have been listened to, where most of those union workers are not union workers. Union. Union. So if the union had been, and, and that also should be, it would seem to be, um, that the, the part of the, the role of unions should be that it represents people who are close to the ground and the operation of a business, who know more than the executives do, who are just you know, working with a bunch of numbers in their, in their offices. So, so the, the suppression of unions, the demonization of un- unions is so much a part of a source uh, factor involved in these kinds of tragedies, right? It all gets back, it, it gets back to that as much as it gets back to anything else. I absolutely agree. And I also just wanted to underline what you said, because I think it's a perfect way to articulate this. This is sociopathic, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, like this is the definition definition of sociopathy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and you can't have a society that is dominated by sociopaths, Mm -hmm. right? Because their whole MO is to attack the fabric of the society that we all share, right? And essentially, like, leave us, um, you know, uh, uh, out to dry in a Hobbesian hellscape of all (laughs) against all. Like, that is the kind of situation that they want. That is the future that they want for us. They're going to be protected just fine. They got all the money in the world. They're going to be okay. We're the ones who are going to be left dealing with the fallout, as we can see in East Palestine. And, um, oh, please... Well, it's that? just as you said, uh, Bill Gates's grandchildren will be okay. And they've even made it clear that if, if push comes to shove, they'll leave the planet. They're already making plans for ways to escape the entire planet if it becomes uninhabitable because of these policies, whether it's these policies having to do with uh, railroad disasters or having to do with uh, oil and gas uh, effect on a fossil fuel extraction, effect on the environment or whatever it is. The bigger problem, of course, is that, as we said before, the, the, the governmental system is not only not the solution, it is the problem. Because it, it seems to me that Washington, with a few brave exceptions, Bernie Sanders and others, is divided into two categories, either people who do not care to fix these problems, or people who don't have the spine to fix these problems, people who don't have the moral courage to fix these problems. And I think that's what people are realizing now. When you talked before about how uh, the workers uh, said, realize no cavalry is coming out to rescue them. I think even that is having a real, a real effect on the consciousness of the people of this country. Because if nobody in the government, certainly nobody in either of these major political parties, can be counted on to really send out the, the cavalry to rescue people, that means it's back on us as people, whether it has to do with with unions or any other aspect of the way our society functions, we're going to have to come up with some some solutions. We're going to have to, you know, it, it, you, you really are in a different place psychologically once you realize that someone does not care about you. Once yeah. you realize that you are being abused by this person or this institution, it's really the same psychological um, uh, situation, and you you realize you have to save yourself. I think, yeah, that's powerfully put and definitely what I am hearing from folks who, you know, like and and we're talking about a beleaguered population that already has enough to deal with. Right. I mean, I think a lot of people don't want to have to deal with this, but they're like, well, what else is there? Like, because clearly no one in power is going to actually do what needs to be done. All the while, the generalized sense among working people, poor and working people, is that things are getting Worse. And like, I know that's a general term, but you probably know what we're talking about because it's not just the railroads. This is happening everywhere, everyone. And this is why I think the, the, the movement, the rank and file movement, the labor unrest, the, the, the kind of rage that is boiling up from the grassroots is 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 like echoing in different parts wherever it crops up because it, in a lot of ways it's responding to the same stuff, the common enemies, the common problems, right? And one of those – the big problem, right, is that the quality of life, the quality of the services that we depend on, the products that we depend on, so much of, of the daily stuff or the stuff of daily life seems to be deteriorating in quality. And that's not uh, your imagination. That is no. what's happening. It's it's mm-hmm. uh, it, railroad workers keep telling me they're like, 
the thing that's hardest to communicate to people about East Palestine is that another one could happen tomorrow yeah. because the tracks are in disrepair in many parts of the country because there aren't enough people to um, check them and the railroads aren't investing enough in track maintenance. So like another one of these could happen. The trains are still as long as they were when when the one derailed in in East Palestine. Railroad workers keep telling me we could shorten the length of those trains tomorrow. Pete Buttigieg or whoever like or no, Pete Buttigieg, sorry, could say, you know, especially if a train is carrying hazardous hazardous material, it cannot be uh, longer than X uh, amount. That is an immediate change that could happen. Um, the electronic braking systems are a no-brainer. Yes, of course, every train should have those. Why are we using an old, a Civil War era braking system on these massive trains that can do <clears throat> so much damage? But the 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 larger part um, is like, what incentive have the rail companies been given to change their ways after everything that we saw transpire last year, right? When Congress and President Biden, let's not forget this was a bipartisan effort. Republicans were calling for the exact same thing in September and all throughout the whole saga. No one wanted a national rail shutdown. No one cared about the concerns that rail workers were raising until they were at the 11th hour and freaking out about what it was going to do to their polling numbers before the midterms or before the the winter holidays, so on and so forth. So I got I got no love for for either party here. But like the thing is, is that um, after what transpired, after Congress essentially forced this uh, contract down workers' throats, that did nothing to address the larger problematic policies that have taken hold of the industry. Again, the cult of the operating ratio, the staff cuts, the draconian attendance policies that are then applied to make the remaining staff unable to take a single paid sick day because there are no more reserve workers left, right? The disinvestment in necessary preventative safety measures because that's not a sexy profit generating thing until you get like derailments like the one in East Palestine and then you realize why it's worth the investment to make sure that uh, you have enough people, you have enough attention to the rails uh, to make sure that derailments like this don't happen um, and they're happening with way more frequency now because we just keep cutting and cutting and cutting. But what people are also telling me is like, this is happening on the highways. Truckers yeah. see this kind of thing all the time. Uh, hospitals, uh, a lot of uh, healthcare workers have gone on strike recently, including in like New York, in the Pacific Northwest, they're gearing up for one, in California, uh, in Minnesota, right? Why? Because they are dealing with the same thing. Nurses keep telling me we are uh, hemorrhaging nurses because they're miserable, they're burnt out, um, after, especially after COVID-19, but also because these like hospital administrators who have never done this job in their lives, they're piling more patients onto us. So we can't give the level of care we've been trained to. And, you know, like something's got to give. Yeah. Educators have been telling me the same thing. This is what the Red for Ed strikes were about before COVID even hit. Yeah. The long-term disinvestment yeah. in our public education system leading to classroom sizes that are like 40 kids in a class or 35. You can't give your it's students. It's crowd to control at a certain point. Yeah. yeah. It, it's truly as though the entire country is a disaster waiting to happen. There are, there are so many situations in which we're just six inches away from falling over the cliff, and that's, that's just not a sustainable place to be. But I do think that people are coming out of their denial. And I think once you do that and you realize how bad it is, sometimes you can't get to the good news until first you're willing to take a good look at the bad news. And yeah. um, you are one of the premier articulators of what's really going on in a way that I know many of us can hear uh, because it's simply the truth. And we do know what the answers are. That's what's so sad. You know, I saw a video of Pete Buttigieg kind of whining. They've just got to stop fighting us when we try to <laughs> regulate them. Did you see that video? Yeah, the I Republicans saw it. <laughs> got, I mean, I guess he's trying to make Republican voters feel better or something. They've got to stop doing this. That's how unafraid the railroad company is of this government because they, the railroad companies know they have this government in their pocket. They yep. know the tens of millions of dollars that they spent on donations. They know it in the government. And I think that what it's not just that the government that people are seeing how um, the government is not there to help them. They are also seeing how in relation to these companies, the government is so powerless, even though many of these people had voted for forces that actually have weakened the government. Now the Democratic Party has acquiesced in its own weakening in order to serve its donors. So something's got to give.
And I think that well, that for me is the main point. Yes, what were you saying? Well, I just um, before we wrap, I wanted to make sure that I answered your question because it is important. Like, so why are unions part of that something, mm -hmm. right? Um, because I, you know, I know I can sound like a broken record, and I want to be upfront with people that like I don't think unionization is going to solve every problem that we have, right? But why do I focus so much on unions? Why do I focus so much not just on organized labor but on the labor movement in general? I'll tell you why, right? Because what you just said, Marianne, I think is a a, a symptom. Of of a society where people have been so thoroughly convinced that they have no power whatsoever right. to change their circumstances. That is that is what this system has done to us. It has made us feel like decision-making power is always uh, entrusted in the hands of a few people at the top who are like, you know, technocratically more capable than we, and we should just entrust the maintenance of our shared world to them. And yet here we are seeing like the disastrous results, right? And so I, th I focus on the labor movement because it is a concrete arena in which everyday regular people learn that they have power to change their circumstances and that they have that power together. The more that they work together with their coworkers, with their community, with folks at other stores and in other industries, the more that they can actually change the things that are hurting them, take care of the things that the bosses and politicians won't. And then once they realize, once we realize that we actually do have power to do something about this, we want more of it and we start building more of it, right? And that is what we really need. That's where the groundswell becomes a political force when people actually take hold of the power that we already have and start applying it to a system that you know desperately wants to ignore us right and so unions are essential because they are uh, an organizational form that that kind of worker power can take a union essentially means that you and your co-workers have each other's backs and that you have a direct say of what ha uh, on what happens in your workplace as is your democratic right right you know so any boss that's telling you that like you know you that you don't have this right or that oh you're going to mess things up by trying to form a union it's like no 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 i am exercising my rights it is not up to you to tell me whether or not i get to exercise my rights and the 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 railroad unions I think people may look at what happened last year and they say, well, they're unionized and this still happened. Yes, because the railway unions are hamstrung and they have their right. hands tied behind their back because rail labor relations on the railroads are governed by the Railway Labor Act, which prevent them from taking the necessary actions that they want to take to like hold these companies accountable. So we don't just need an organized labor movement in name. We need an organized labor movement with teeth, an independent labor movement that can advocate for for the working class, for the rank and file, not for one political party or another, right? But that is a real force to be reckoned with where working people, as we used to have, can really assert their needs and their priorities on the ledger of society's priorities, right? We don't have that anymore. If since the 80s, union density has declined uh, and all of the like deregulation, the money going to the 1%, wage stagnation, like it's all gone in the wrong direction. So right. we need the labor movement as a backstop so that working people can actually have a collective force to say, no, we're not going to let society no. keep going in this direction. Right. Well, Marty Walsh is leaving the Department of Labor. Who would you like to see uh, be the new Secretary of Labor? Sarah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's my wish First list, all, do Sarah. Think, <laughs> do you think there's any chance that Joe Biden would choose Sarah Nelson as the Secretary of Labor? And if he did, would she want the job? It's a tricky question because everything in my – every fiber of my being says no, right? Because – why? Because I want it. Like if I yeah. want it, that means Joe Biden's not going to give it to us, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> but like, he's got Lena Khan. I think Lena Khan is extraordinary and so – well, and that's that's the thing. That's, that's where I'll qualify what I say, right? I mean like I, I got – you know, I, people who know me know my feelings on Joe Biden, Donald Trump, the main parties whatsoever. But – you know, where Biden has actually helped labor and the reason why a lot of unions and non-union workers actually believe him when he says he's a pro-labor president is not because of what he does and not even necessarily because of what a Congress does, but it's because of the appointments that Biden has made like Jennifer Abruzzo to the National Labor Relations Board. 
I can hate Biden in every other respect, but that's a good appointment. Yeah, Jennifer Marty Bruce- Walsh. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. And I do with him across the board want to give credit where credit is due. But Bernie had wanted to be Secretary of Labor. He would not yeah. allow that to happen. And then Marty no, Walsh is hardly someone that we can look to as a great champion of labor. So um, it's going yeah. to be interesting to see what he comes up with in terms of this next appointment. So let's hold in our minds that it will be someone like uh, like Sarah Nelson. I certainly agree with you that the um, uh, that the reemergence, resurgence, reinvigoration of the labor movement is an is an important factor in addressing this whole systems breakdown in our society today. I think elections are also important. I don't think it's either or. Um, mm-hmm. I've been sort of concerned about some of the people who dwell within the um, anti-establishment place. Uh, who recognize some of the problems that you and I recognize, who also take this anti-electoral perspective because we have to work within the system and outside the system. I think it's got to be a both-and approach. Um, I think that's right. Well, mm -hmm. just like it's got to be the the mental shift that I think folks need to make who are in that camp is like the the legitimate critique that folks in that camp have is that like elections cannot be the end all be all of our political activity, right? They are a necessary factor. They, the election, the elections that we have, the people who get elected, the policies they push shape the, con- the, the, the conditions upon which our activity happens, right? Any other organizing we're going to do is going to be impacted by whether or not the pro act gets passed, right? Whether or not Roe gets overturned by a, a reactionary Supreme court right like all of this factors into what we do but electing people cannot be the end of what we do and that's i think what people need to understand as someone who has run and as someone who is running i i certainly don't think elections are be all and end all but neither is labor neither is any other sector of society i think that uh when you have a whole systems breakdown you have to have a whole systems response and it really comes down to each of us i think knowing that each of us has a part to play in whatever lane we find ourselves um whatever our skill set whatever our propensities i mean we all it's just like with you you knew in your gut this is where you belong um, you've had a wide array of interests and uh, professional educational experiences, but you know that this is what uh, you're meant to do at this time with your life. And I think more and more people are feeling that, that calling within to, to where they can best serve. So I really want to thank you, Max, because uh, your eloquence and your um, a sophisticated articulation of these issues, I think, is so meaningful for so many people. It is for me personally, and I know it is for my audience as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you and I think I'm going to see you on March 4th, right? I'll see you. Much love to you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay, everybody, you heard it here. The brilliant Max Alvarez and his eloquent articulation of what is happening, not only with the resurgence in labor, but very specifically what has happened, what is happening, and what needs to happen in East Palestine, Ohio. But all of us need to realize this is bigger than East Palestine. This is simply how hypercapitalism, whatever you want to call it, unfettered, deregulated capitalism, has been weaponized against people, against animals, and against the planet. What uh, Max and I were talking about is that it's basically a sociopathic system that does not care. If your bottom line is, is corporate profit, that means that that takes precedence over the health, safety, and well-being of people and animals and planet. And that system will not disrupt itself. We have to disrupt it. It's time for the people to step in now. Um, East Palestine is a microcosm. It's an embodiment of everything that has gone wrong. But I think the reaction of so many people, the horror that so many people feel, including myself, and of course, I'm sure, including you, is also a, a, a sign that we are waking up and that we are readying ourselves and preparing to make the kinds of changes that absolutely need to be made in order to push back push back on these sociopathic forces. Um, Washington, as I said to Max, is divided in too many ways, uh, with some few uh, brave exceptions, into two categories. People who either do not care to fix these fundamental systemic problems or don't have the moral spine, don't have the moral courage, don't have the spine to fix it. And um, that's where you and I are going to have to come in. So uh, let's get this done. It's time for our generation to stand up. I don't know how many more disasters we have to see, such as that which happened in East Palestine, before each and every one of us gets to the point of saying, okay, enough is enough. I'm Marianne Williamson, and thank you so much for being with me. See you later.